Leadership is taking people on a journey where there is a vision, guidance and purpose. Good leaders lead with the heart as well as the head. Leadership means doing the right thing for the right reason, no matter how difficult it might be. You're listening to Leadership Unwrapped, a podcast where you will hear from people who are living leadership every day. Well, Niamh, I never thought many years ago when I was teaching and I read the book Work and Worth that I would actually have the opportunity to, first of all, be working with you on a podcast and secondly, (laughs) to be uh, interviewing Dr. Tony Humphreys. Oh, my heavens above. It was like the best day ever to meet him and to um, to speak to him. I just think he's so thoughtful and ethical and uh, really interesting to in his view about how we engage with work and how we are as human beings in the world um i just for for i just still can't even stop thinking about it i think it was an absolutely fantastic conversation it was such a powerful conversation and um it, it was based off of we both recently read the book psychological safety so a lot of the conversation was around that but i've since been just reading more and more and more of his work um yeah. and, as well because i i can't stop thinking about the conversation either i think the way that he describes how we interact with people based mm-hmm. on how we're feeling about ourselves or what we're thinking in that time, talking about engaging with each other from an I place yeah. or a yeah. you place and putting almost blame on other people or putting labels on other people in comparison to really seeing the person. I really, like, I, and I, I know I've said, we've talked about it so many times since. Um, yeah. I, I really, I don't know if I ever had a conversation that resonated so much with the way I think about how we interact with each other. Yeah, yeah, me too. Me too. It was like as if in the conversation, um, I was finally, like I was sitting down with someone who has who has engaged with some of the similar philo- philosophies as I would have had, but others also, and that they came together in this very fluid conversation, but, but in a very practical way. Um, and I think, I mean... The initial thought was that we would meet him in relation to workplace uh, workplace bullying awareness week, the international week that that Linda Crockett has set up, that that Judy, our colleague and friend, is organising here in Ireland. Uh, but it was so much more than that. It was it was so much more than that, and the conversation sort of went up a level. So it wasn't really about. Um, bullying and what you do about bullying but it was about the nature of the human spirit and if you get Mm -hmm. that right you don't have a bullying problem in the first place and that to me is the type of conversation we need to be having it really gets to the core of what we need to do so um yeah, I hope our yeah. listeners get as much from it as we did. If it, yeah, because if we have more awareness about the way that we're interacting with each other and the reasonings behind it, and taking yeah. that moment to stop and think about what what is all of this, why is this coming from me, you know, and having awareness around that, it, none of the rest of the negative behaviours like bullying yeah. or incivility are, are even an option, yeah. because at that point you're 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 not interacting with each other in a way that could lend to that. Um, so as you say it's not quite as explicit but it was it it's still so relevant to it and much more um yeah Yeah, i think it went far deeper so yeah so so listeners i think you i really genuinely think you're going to get a lot from this one and um do feel free to contact us on our email leadership unwrapped at protonmail.com for uh suggestions or responses we'd love to hear from you yeah, it's one of those things I'd love if we could get all the listeners and put them in the room there with us because yeah. it was just, yeah. it was something special. Yeah, yeah it was. Yeah. Brilliant. Yeah, enjoy. Our guest today is Dr. Tony Humphreys, world-renowned clinical psychologist. And as I do the introduction, I'm going to do full disclosure that I'm probably going to fangirl loads here because <laughs> I feel like I'm in thinking royalty mm-hmm. when I'm in the company um, of Tony. I've followed Tony's work for many years, actually from my beginning of my journey as a teacher many years ago, and have found it profoundly influential and reassuring many times um, as I've accessed some of your writing. So I'm absolutely mm-hmm. thrilled and excited. And I'm also going to say I was so excited I didn't even sleep last night because I really <laughs> wanted to make sure that we got here on time and that we were going to be with you. Tony has a large private practice in which he deals with all kinds of human suffering, physical, psychological, social, and many others. Uh, he does work with universities such as UCC and with TUS. 
He has written many books, and I'm sure many of our readers are going to be familiar with some of them. They've been translated into many languages across the world, and I know that in at least two times in my own journey, a different kind of teacher and work and worth have profoundly influenced my thinking and given me comfort at times of challenge in my own work as a teacher and subsequently as an academic. So I'm so grateful that those books were written and looking forward to chatting more about other books. He's written many, many articles and many of you will be familiar with his work through the Irish Examiner and other national newspapers. But Tony is really committed to the creation of relationships and deep listening to people's stories as a way of understanding and knowing a person's journey and being able to support them to flourish in life. So I'm super excited to have this time with you, Tony, and mm. you're so busy. So thank you for saying yes to us. Thank you, Trish. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, I know it's amazing to be down here in your fabulous office in <laughs> such a gorgeous location as well. We had such a good time coming down even. Yeah. So we were chatting loads about your writing coming yeah. down and the challenges for us in thinking about some of the ways that you're looking at how human beings interact with themselves and with yeah. others. Mm-hmm. So we're looking forward to chatting with those with you. I'm sorry now, I was in the back seat of the car and I could have been listening again. You know? yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I enjoyed it. Seven yeah. of us, we go, geez, that's a bit profound. Yeah. <laughs> because it does make you think yourself. Your, your books are very almost dialogical with the reader. It's like you're, it's like you're sitting talking yes, to the person yeah. and the way that you write <clears throat> them. So you yeah. feel like you're having a conversation with you mm. and then you're left thinking, oh, that's a bit, mm. I need to think about myself in that space. Very good. Mm-hmm. Is that intentional? <clears throat> Is that voice... I think because I write from experience all the time. Yeah. Not from kind of a theory point of view, but from yeah. an experiential point of view. And I think it's it's like a story then. Yes. Yeah. So the writing then comes out that way. Yeah. It's not propositional, definitely. It's, it feels um, more connected to the reader that, that you're... That you're I don't know if you're doing this, I'm projecting this onto you, but that you're thinking about how the reader is going to read it as you're writing it. Are you doing that? Yeah, I think what, yeah, I think because I'll always write from the experiences that I've had with my own life and with all the people I've worked with over the years. Mm -hmm. And so I know then, because I'm I'm relating the stories and, and, and all the experiences I've had with people, that that will touch into other people's lives when they read it. Yeah. So it's it's like you're still trying to create a relationship to the book as well. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. 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 Get that. Yeah. I have that yeah. feel definitely from, from yeah. reading. Yeah. What we like to start out with is to just give us a sense of your journey of how you've how you've um how you do what you do, how you've arrived at what you do. Do you want to give the listeners a just how many years have you got to, now? Uh, well, <laughs> if, if you'd allow us to move in a lifetime, I'd tell you. Yeah. <laughs> but we won't do that yet. We won't talk you. I suppose the main thing is that I've had quite a story, right? And um, and so, you know, with my family, right? My mother being an invalid, father an unhappy man, right? I became the third parent, right? Yeah. Um, and at age nine, it was a belief in my family. You never have to worry about Tony because Tony can take care of us all. Mm. And I could do it all, the washing, the cleaning, the cooking, looking, getting my mother out of her bed, washing and dressing, putting her onto a wheelchair, doing the laundry I did everything right Mm -hmm. and I um, there was a plot then in my family right that my father and sister she was she was six years older um, they had a coalition right and and that was their way of trying to for my father to get some kind of because he didn't have a a wife he didn't uh, cripple right um but their plan was that, even though I was always first in class in, in primary school, they didn't send me to secondary school. Oh, okay. Right? Yeah, which is interesting. They sent yeah. me to a commercial school. And it was only years later the plan emerged that they, what they, when I went to School of Commerce, right, within two years I had completed all their courses because I was very good with figures. And the school got me a job as a bookkeeper when I was age 15 and I continued to study in accountancy at night. So by age 18, I would have been a qualified accountant. Wow. I'd have a good salary. And the plan was that my father and sister were going to leave and leave me with my mother. Oh. Right. Right. And I can understand. My heart goes out to them. They were trying to find some life for themselves. Yeah. Right. Okay. So I think then there's... There's always a part of us at a deeper level that knows that's going on. I had no sense now, consciously, of that story 
but at a deeper level, I seem to know. And one day, one of the afternoons I came back from work, got my mother out of bed, da da da. I sat, I eventually sat down to have my own lunch, and whatever look I gave, there was a calendar on the wall, St. Patrick's Missionaries. And I was aged, how old I was then? 18. And um, I suddenly wanted to be a priest. I was so absolutely convinced, right? Mm. I went had spiritual experiences and so on. Um, but it was my escape route. But yeah. I didn't see that it was an escape route. Mm. And of course, it was the one thing that my family couldn't object to because everybody wanted a priest in the family at that time in Ireland, right? So it was brilliant, really, right? Um, and <clears throat> so there's no way that my father could have said, you can't be a priest, right? So that would have been totally contrary to the Irish culture mm-hmm. at the time. So then I went off into the priesthood <clears throat> and um, seven years later, I'm two months from ordination and I don't believe in Catholicism anymore. Right? Mm-hmm. I believe in spirituality. Mm-hmm. But it's like a new, a new book I'm finishing. It's called The Book of Realizations. But one of the major realizations for me was there's an awful difference between religion and spirituality. Yeah. yeah. And spirituality is a very personal experience, right? But there's no laws. There's no, there's no sin. There's no evil, right? Um, and so I wrote a letter home saying, Dear Mum and Dad, just a little bit of truth. Mm, there are certain teachings of the church that I wouldn't be able to go along with, and it would be hypocritical of me to go forward for the priesthood, given those reservations I have. A little bit of truth. I can still remember the sentence so well. So the letter goes home, and my mother was amazing. Anytime there was a crisis, she would faint. That's brilliant. <laughs> It's a good tactic. <laughs> it's a brilliant tactic, right? Because she, she gets the attention then, right? And so one of the sad things I have about my mum and dad, right, I never actually sat with them and asked them their story. I really yeah. have regrets around that. Yeah. Um, anyway, the letter went home. It's read, my mother faints, right? And then very sadly, she writes back into her crippled hand, if you come out, I'll die, Right? And my father writes back in a very aggressive hand, if you come out, I'll never talk to you again. Mm. What am I going to do now? Mm. So I decided to go ahead with the priesthood. And I was with a French order who had an order, who had a house out in South America. And my plan was, I'll go ahead with the ordination, because it's only going to be in two months' time. Come back to Cork, say Mass in the local church, bless all the locals, right? And then I'll volunteer to go out to the house in South America. And my plan was, when I get to South America, I disappear. Good plan, wasn't it? Give me a question. Yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yeah. 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 Ten hours. <laughs> so, what well, was very interesting at the time, I'd been in the hospital, I was bringing blood up from some part of my body, and they did test after test, but they couldn't trace the origins of it. Come back in a month's time or so, we'll try again. But it had continued. And when I decided then I'd go ahead with the priesthood, I had a dream, right? And in the dream, it was just a voice. And the voice very clearly said to me, Tony, if you go down the road now once again of pleasing others, you are in great danger. And of course, the blood absolutely convinced me mm-hmm. that I was in danger. Mm-hmm. Right? So we just got up perhaps five in the morning, went down to the Father Superior. Where did they get the titles from? <laughs> <laughs> I know. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, told him I was leaving. He was kind of happy because he felt I was influencing the other monks. Right? <laughs> uh, but um, but that dream saved my life, really, mm. and absolutely. And dreams are gifts from the soul. They tell you where you are and where you need to go to. And the blood symbolized blood ties. Right? Mm. And as adults, we need to cut the ties that bind. Mm-hmm. We're here to live our own lives, free, not tied to others, not enmeshed with others, but separate. And then there's a great line that I often use, separateness is the basis for togetherness. Mm, yeah, yeah, the yeah. more separate we are, the closer we are together. The more enmeshed we are, the more conflict. Yeah. And the most common relationship, because of fear, is enmeshment. The rarest relationship, when you're fearless, is being mm-hmm. separate. Mm. And it's a major journey going from being fearful to being fearless. But it's a journey where if we're capable of creating fearfulness, we are equally capable of creating fearlessness. But it's a long journey. I always say the longest and most exciting journey is a journey inwards. 
to come into your possession of yourself, occupying your own individuality, and come into that fearless place that I'm here to live my own life from the inside out, not from the outside in. But as children, mm -hmm. we had to keep our eyes on the adults who were looking out for us, right? Otherwise, we would have been even greater danger. But as an adult, I don't need to depend on friend or partner or boss or anybody else. I can depend on myself, thank you. And it's one of the greatest journeys, is the journey inwards. Yeah. yeah. And do you think, I, don't, I want to hear so much more about your journey, but if I could just interject <laughs> for a second. When you're talking about fear and fearlessness, do you see it as you can reach a place of full and total fearlessness or a place of fear still existing, but you having the tools and the capacity to recognize it and move forward with it out, without it consuming you the same way fear d does. It's, it's a journey, to, you know, a major journey to go from being fearful. And some people are terrified that I've worked with over the years, right? And in many ways, I was terrified of living my own life. And so as you gradually become conscious of how you needed to develop fear in order to survive and get some acceptance in this world, as you become conscious of it, you begin to take little actions bit by bit by bit, and your consciousness will keep increasing. Eventually, you'll get to the fearless place. But given the, the level of hurts or threats that are there, you never know how long the journey is going to be. I always say to the people that come to me for, for, for their suffering, right, I'll wait patiently for an eternity for you to become present to yourself. Because you never know the level of hurt that people have experienced, mm. right? Because if I say to a client, just how long have you been coming to see me now? <laughs> sure, now they're going to feel hurt, aren't they? Yeah. Are you questioning that I'm not good enough or whatever? So I'll hold them as long as they want to come to see me. And if it's an eternity, then I will hold in with them for the eternity. Yeah. So I certainly have come to a place of being fearless. <laughs> my okay. wife, my wife's sister, often uh, says to me, "Tony, have you got any fear at all?" <laughs> <laughs> I said, "No, I actually, I've, I've left to go. <laughs> I don't bother with that anymore. No, no, it doesn't, <laughs> it doesn't serve me anymore. <laughs> yeah, but it's lovely to be fearless, and I have no." Yeah, I'll take on any, any challenge, really. So Of course. Yeah. So then you were about to go to South America. That was the plan. Yeah. Then yeah. you had I then the had a dream, that an amazing dream that saved my life. And so I, I left then. And when I went home, nobody spoke to me. Okay, and unfortunately, overheard my mother saying to neighbours, he's such an embarrassment to have around to now. It was very painful, yeah. but it was one of the best things I, I heard. So the following day, I saw the vestments and the chalice I'd been given. Shop very kindly gave me back money for them. Got myself a grey suit. Got on a train to Dublin. Found um, a boarding house in, in Rat Mines actually, and was very fortunate that an ex seminarian friend of mine he had gone on to the Jesuits and he had left as well. And I hadn't heard that he'd left, but he somehow heard that I had left, and somehow himself and his uh, great friend found me in Rat Mines. Don't know how they found me. Yeah. Right? Because <clears throat> I was now 25 years of age. I hadn't done an even shirt, remember? I had done oh, yeah. So I thought I couldn't get into university. And they came and anyway, they found me very kindly. And at some point they were saying to me, listen, oh, we started university ourselves um, a couple of weeks ago, right? Why don't you join us? And I said to my friend, but Paddy, I don't have an even shirt. How can I get into university? And he said, sure, once you're over 24 years of age, you can get in. So then I joined university. I spent 13 years in university after that. Mm. Right. And I did teaching degrees. And I taught primary and secondary school. And again, you know, I was still quite shy at that time. I, I, I hated myself so much because of other experiences in childhood. And when I was out socially, I'd always have a book with me and I'd hide behind the book. <laughs> yeah. And in one of the, it was in Randall and I, I changed uh, accommodation. But the, the boyfriend of one of the daughters in the house said to me one evening, Tony, there's an event going down at the local tennis club tonight. Sure, why don't you come down and join us? And at that stage, I still wouldn't say no. Right. 
Um, so, so I went down, and eventually he went off with his friends, and I was there on my own, right? But I would always have my book in my pocket, right? So I found the corners being... <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and eventually, these two women came over to me, right? And they said, oh, come on out and join us. And I remember thinking, they're only saying that now because they feel sorry for me, right? So I said, oh, I just need a bit of time. I won't thank you. <laughs> so they went off, right? But very, very interestingly, about maybe a year or two later, I can't remember exactly, I was at another event. I had kind of shifted somewhat, right? And um, out of hiding. Um, and one of the women was at this event and she comes over to me and she says, I remember you, she said. And I said, actually, I remember you as well. And she said, you know, now when my friend and came over, myself came over to you that evening and said, come out and join us. And you said, no, you need some time on your own. We thought we weren't good enough for you. Mm. And I said, actually, it was the contrary, that I felt I wasn't good enough for you. But it's lovely now that we can now have that conversation. So yeah. we actually dated for about two years after that. Yeah. Yeah. So, yeah. So then I did the teaching. I loved t- primary school teaching and secondary school teaching. But at age 30, I decided I want to go back to university full time for nine years and study psychology. Right? And didn't know how I was going to make the money. But one thing I've learned is always ways of making money. Right? Yeah. I didn't rob any banks. But <laughs> Good to know. It didn't come to that. <laughs> but I worked as a taxi driver, worked as a waiter, I worked you know, as a bookkeeper, because I had those skills still. And lots of other kind of jobs. Well, I used to go to America every summer, um, work June, July, August, September, and as a waiter, mm. and did very well there. I went back to the same place, was well known there. Um, but then, anyway, as I age 30, I decided I was going to go back to university full time and study psychology. And my father comes thundering up to Dublin, right, from Cork. And kind of said, What the fuck are you doing, right? <laughs> <laughs> you left the priesthood and now you're leaving a good pension for a secondary school teaching job, right? And I remember looking him straight in the eye, but it's my life. I'm, mm. here. I'm here to live my life. And that was a major turning point. Yeah, yeah, huge. That was a major turning point. And then I started therapy for myself as well then, because I was still the carer in many ways, right? And I used to have very bad back pain. I could be crippled for days and end, right? And when I started therapy, the realisation hit me. I put my back out for everybody, but I don't back myself up. Mm. So I now started backing myself up, looking out for myself, and I won't do for another, that's what they can do for themselves. Mm-hmm. And if you can't do it for yourself, I'll support you to do it for yourself, but I won't do it for you. Mm-hmm. And that was a major turning point for me. Stop rescuing people, right? Empower people, not rescue. Yeah. And my back pain is it was amazing, but there are several years, it's just stopped. Wow. Yeah, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. And, and then I did the very good degrees, um, the BA uh, in, on the psychology in... in Psychology part in UCC, and then I went on. I did a very good one, so they gave me a demonstratorship, so I had money, and then did I did an MA, then a master's for two years, and then when I finished that, I saw an ad by the Midwestern Health Board looking to send people off to England to train as clinical psychologists, mm-hmm. so they they gave me a salary then for four years to do my PhD in clinical psychology, and with the requirement I come back and work with them for a minimum of two years. Which I did. Um, so that was, I, I really enjoyed the whole challenge of in, in UCC and then Birmingham University where I did the clinical mm-hmm. psychology. Mm-hmm. And during when, when I finished the master's part of the, the, the PhD, I then went to work in a psychiatric hospital in England in Staffordshire, whilst I was continuing then to do a thesis to complete a PhD. Okay. And I had a full time job there. And the office for the clinical psychology was on the grounds of the psychiatric hospital. It was not in the psychiatric hospital. So clients would be sent to us, or individuals, from the hospital over to see us and people from the community. So I didn't get the experience of being in the psychiatric hospital, but I certainly did get the experience of people being labelled schizophrenic, bipolar, depressed, all the labels, right? And very quickly, I set up a very good practice. 
And again, I had waiting lists and people would <clears throat> who were waiting. And what I did was I created a group for them. So I'd be able to see them once a week as a group. And then there was a space then for an individual session. They could come on to the individual session. Um, and that was very, yeah, I really liked that, right? And then I finished then the PhD. I'd been working in that hospital for about two and a half years. And then I need to come back then and I work in the Western Health Board for the minimum of two years, right? Um, and so I came back then to the Midwestern Health Board, working in the psychiatric hospital in, in Ennis, in Limerick first and then in Ennis. And then I was in the psychiatric hospital and then I saw all these people in the back wards that hadn't seen the light of day many years, right? being labelled, medicated, shock treatment, and at their own my God. So I then started working with individuals, and then I set up clinics throughout Clare as well. We had queues out the door, right? Mm. So the, the, the approach really got people yeah. right. Now, obviously, the psychiatrists were very threatened uh, by it. Um, um, but I wondered, how was it that I was, being, that I was effective in England, right? And now here, when I'm back in Ireland, I now suddenly realise there is no such thing as mental illness, right? That people have amazing ways of surviving traumas and adverse experiences um, and, and what they call madness were actually major ways. And there's always the, the story I tell about a young man that was sent to me um, and he'd been labelled uh, schizophrenic, right? And he believed he was Jesus Christ. <laughs> and he, um, he'd be down the street telling everybody, I'm, I'm Jesus, I'm here to save you all, right? And then he'd be carted off to psychiatric hospital, major medication, shock treatment, right? And then he'd be there and then he'd be quiet and then he'd be discharged. But no sooner he was discharged, he'd be back down. And I was at, giving some talk someplace and his sister came up to me and she said, she told me about her brother. Would, would you see him? And I said, I'd love to see your brother, right? Mm -hmm. um, so I did see him. And um, when I went out to the waiting room, I'd also introduce myself as Tony. I don't say, I'm Dr. Humphreys, right? Why did, why did we do that? Mm -hmm. Why would I say, well, I'm Dr. Humphreys, right? What happens immediately if I say that? A space between. Do, a yeah, me, a barrier, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. I'll always say, I'm Tony, and thanks for coming, right? So, shook his hand and he put out his hand and I shook his hand and he said I know I'm Jesus Christ and I said oh welcome Jesus you take people where they're at I'm looking forward to meeting you come on in right so he came in and he sits in the chair <laughs> and he's on the edge of his chair but do you believe I'm Jesus do you believe I'm Jesus and I said of course I believe you're Jesus Christ I've no doubt there are very good reasons for you to be Jesus Christ right so I said tell me what do you gain from being Jesus Christ I was amazing the word came out. Recognition. Wow, well, yeah. And I said, and what do you gain? I could fictitious name now, by being James Murphy. Anonymity. Oh, I said, can I shake mm. your hand? You chose the best known person in Ireland to get to be recognized because in a world where you were anonymous, how bloody brilliant of you. And I said, I can tell you something though. I see your brilliance now, but I see you for your own person. I don't need for you, you to be Jesus Christ, for me to see you. And we then built up a relationship. Yeah. Never went back to the psychiatric hospital. Yeah, you could see the brilliance of James Murphy. Yeah, yeah, yeah absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Very much, yeah. So that then, that whole thing of, you know, even what I had trained in, in mainly CBT, DBT and things like that, I no longer believed in those. I didn't believe that people are conditioned anymore. And what they need is deconditioning and reconditioning. Oh my God! Come on. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, what I saw that what people need, they've suffered in relationship, and their suffering can only be resolved through relationship. And my main primary issue was to create a relationship with them, and to know that no matter what they present to me, whether it's major depression, whether it's self harming, right, whether it's addictions. These were all solutions, not problems. Mm -hmm. And it's good to see that, that an addiction is a solution. But if I tell you that addiction is a serious problem, sure, I'm going to increase it. Yeah. And, you know, an addiction, right, 
whether people are taking alcohol or drugs or whatever, sure, it eases the pain, right? It gives some lift when they are so depressed within themselves. It's not a problem, it's a solution. What you need to get to do, what is the source yes. of their addiction? What is, what's the suffering that they have not been able, that haven't even been asked to give expression to? And that reminds me, you know, Carl Jung, right, the psychoanalyst, right, that, that wrote at one stage that the cause of human suffering is that people have not been able to tell their stories, right? But not for the first time, I kind of rewrote what Jung said, right? <laughs> and said, no, the cause of human suffering is that people have not been asked to tell their stories. And in psychiatry and in medicine, right, people are not asked to tell the stories. They are labelled on the basis of symptoms. Yeah. And what I discovered with all the people I've worked with over many years now, there's always a story. And what you need to do is ask them, I'd like to hear your story. But if, you, if you, I don't ask you your story and just label you on the basis of symptoms, now I'm going to say now that you have a chronic condition or you've got a mental illness, right? And it's very fascinating in medicine. I wrote a book called The Compassionate Intentions of Illness. That in medicine, with all the thousands of research that has been done, there's not one sentence from a patient. And I mean not one sentence. And that's not me being critical of medicine. That's the training they get. Yeah. And one of the things to, to dare to challenge one's own profession, sure, it's, it's major, right? Mm -hmm. So... And even for me to challenge psychiatry, but also to challenge my own profession in terms of CBT, DBT and things like that, right? You need to be very solid in yourself. You need to be separate. You need to be grounded. And you speak from the I place. I'm not being critical. I understand. That's where you're at professionally. That's how you got your identity. That's how you're seen in this world, right? And to question that, well, will I not be seen now if I'm not the doctor, if I'm not the psychologist? If I'm... Yeah. Um, so, yeah. The challenge, or like the question that you're asking, will I not be seen if I'm no longer yeah. the expert? Yeah, exactly. That person who's yeah. holding that powerful place that... that yeah, and that's a lovely word that you use, expert. Because what I say to the individuals that come to see me, I hate the word client or patient, right? But the individuals that come to see me, I always let them know, you're the expert. Yeah. I'm mm -hmm. not the expert on yeah. you. You're the expert on yourself. What I'll be creating is the holding of you to bring you into your expertise, right? And, and now to find the safety to talk to me about all the things that, that you suffered and experienced in your life to date. And it's, when, you, when you say that to a person, right, you're the expert, right? How does that help? She's affirming them, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, it's yeah. It's showing belief yeah, in them, right? Yeah. And them. Yeah. So, so that realisation, right, no matter what the behaviour that it was presented to me, right, there is always a purpose to it. It is always yeah. creative. And one of our great creations is fear. Fear yeah. is a creation. But how many people see as fear as a creation? They see it as a weakness. Or, yeah, or, a, or, a reality yeah. that's a, yeah. a weakness. Oh, yeah. Exactly, or a vulnerability. Mm -hmm. No, we're not. We're too powerful. We are powerful beyond measure, right? If you think of that Jesus Christ story, my God, how powerful that young man was to get visibility in a world where he was invisible. Mm -hmm. How bloody ge yeah, ingenious, yeah, right? Yeah. So we are powerful beyond measure. And so no matter what, you know, how to put it, pain and suffering and depression, anxiety, self-harming, addictions that people bring me, I always see them as solutions to not being loved, not being seen, or being traumatised, mm -hmm. or having been, you know, how it was neglected in so many ways. Um, and then, you know, when parents do that, I'm not blaming the parents. They have their story. Mm -hmm. And who listens to parents' story? Mm -hmm. So, and that's why I was saying that, that human suffering is not biographical. It's not biological, right, or neurological. It is bi biographical, right, and it is generational. Mm -hmm. and, and that's, that's you see that time and time again right but I think one of the questions I was going to say there earlier was I was wondering 
that when I was in England, right, I was working very much along the CBT line, right, with and was having great success with, mm-hmm. with individuals there. And I wondered that when I came back to Ireland and I had that realisation, you know, well, there is no such thing as mental illness. So people are not conditioned, right? <clears throat> they are not victims, right? They are creators in the face of adverse experiences. Mm-hmm. And I wondered, I wondered, how was it then, though, that I was being effective in England? Mm. Whereas in Ireland, I was seeing things in a very different way, right? When I worked in the psychiatric mm-hmm. hospitals, mm-hmm. I was I worked with them, yeah, eight years in in Ennis and two years in England. And of course, the answer was. What was, what was the answer to that? How was it that I was being effective in England? And the answer was relationship. Oh. I always created very strong relationships with each individual that came to see me, right? And that's ultimately, if the source of people's suffering or labels that's put on the suffering is relationship, which it is. Relationships mm. in the family, relationships in the school, relationships in the community, relationships in the workplace. Then the resolution is relationship. But a relationship of a nature that's unconditional, that sees the power of the person, the creativity of the person, the genius of the person. And then creating that, holding them for them to slowly but surely come out of the protective place of hiding, right? And like, look at what the hiding I did for years, being the good boy, looking after everybody else, how clever that was. Look at the attention I got for that. But then, of course, when I began to come out of hiding and realising that was my very clever way of getting attention, but now I need to give attention to myself. Mm-hmm. I need to attend to my own life and slowly but surely begin to live my own life from the inside out. As children, largely, necessarily and creatively, we have to live our lives from the outside in because mm. we're dependent on parents and teachers and so on, child minders. Yeah. But as an adult, I want to come to that place of living my life from the inside out, step by step by step. Mm. Long journey. Mm-hmm. I always say the longest and most exciting journey is the journey inwards. But it's an exciting one when you mm. come into to really seeing the power beyond measure that has always been there, but now is consciously there in a way that you can be free be separate, be fearless, mm. be your own person, and then also see other people from that perspective. You won't judge now, you won't criticize, you won't label, you'd be in awe of what other person brings me, right? Yeah. yeah. Do you think there's... It can be a bit scary to begin to build that relationship with yourself when you've lived your life, yeah. you know, looking outward or... Be, or, or working from the outside in. Is there and a courage piece to that? Is there, is there? Well, I mean, it's, it's, of course it's scary because it was scary for you to be yourself all your life. Mm-hmm. Um, and like I, I said earlier, my my escape route was into the priesthood, right? Otherwise, I would have gotten trapped in the family for the rest of my yeah. life, right? Yeah. But it's scary to say I'm here to live my own life because would you be rubbish now? It's like... Yeah. 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 Is that you're being so selfish, right? Yeah, no, actually, yeah. yeah, I need to be selfish. I need to live my own life. But then when I do, I'm independent. I'm not reliant. I'm not dependent on others, right? And I will support others to come down that path of independence mm-hmm. as well. But it's, it's, it, remember, when we were children, right, it was very scary for us to say, you know, I don't want to be the third parent here, right? I, I I mean, you would even even have the thought, right? Yeah. So, to dare come out of hiding, to dare be your own self, to dare... I love the word authority because it means authorship of self. Wow. And when we come into authorship of ourselves, which was the most frightening thing to do, because you were likely to... Like, you know, when my father came up and said, what the fuck are you doing? You're leaving the priesthood and now you're leaving mm. good well, pen- a yeah. good pensionable job. To, for me to be able to say, but it's my life. No, mm-hmm. it took me 30 years to get it there, right? And I think having survived all the traumas of leaving the priesthood and the projection that was there and then surviving my own depression and so on really brought me to that place where I said, I'm here to live my life. Mm-hmm. I didn't say it hostilely, but I said it very definitely. I'm here to live my life, not your life. Mm-hmm. 
But of course, it's scary to start that yeah. journey. And that's why we've talked about it. We'll only start that journey, actually, when we find psychological safety. Mm-hmm. Yeah. That's where my mind had just gone. Yeah. yeah, me too. When we find somebody, it's like that young man when he, I said, I see you for yourself, right? Mm-hmm. I don't need for you to be Jesus Christ for me to see you. That was such a platform for him, a safety for him. And the tone of the voice, the eye contact, right? The expression of love and belief in the person. So they're all holding worlds of safety for the person. And they'll test, they'll test it to begin with, and rightly so, right? Because why would they suddenly trust somebody that would know mm-hmm. they've only met? And wisely then they'll test it. And I understand that completely. And like I said earlier, I will wait patiently. I'm not going to say, well, just how many weeks, how many years have you been coming to see me now? Mm-hmm. That's counterproductive. I'm now being critical, right? So I'll, I'll, I'll wait that eternity for you. Yeah. yeah. I, I love that piece about when you said, I'll wait patiently, even if it's an eternity, yeah. I'll wait patiently for you. Because when I was reading Psychological Safety, um, one of the thoughts that struck me was when you wrote about that when we are impatient with others, it's actually an absence of oh, patience for the self absolutely. that's being played out yeah, there. Yeah, 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 I found yeah. that really um, insightful because t- because it, it speaks truth to me about that, you know, that if you're impatient with others, it's actually an absence of... Oh, yeah. It's an absence of patience, patience for ourselves, man. Yeah. Yeah. And if I'm critical of others, it's, it's, it's again showing all the critical things that happened to me, right? Yeah. And that I, I buried, right? I, but I'm... Just, and projecting it out onto another man. Right? Mm. And it's like, you know, that if you take bullying, right? Bullying is one of our great creations, right? Because you can control others to make sure they don't hurt you again or they stay, they don't open their mouths, right? You do what I tell you, right? Where did that come from? Why was that necessary to be created, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. But if I, if I see bullying as a problem, I will increase it. And I, we were talking about that when, when yeah. there's a lot of anti-bullying campaigns now. And they, they will increase bullying because you're criticizing it. Mm-hmm. Well, what we need is understanding bullying campaigns, not anti-bullying campaigns. And to get into the story of the person, how was it? You know, that I work with many men, right? The one way of getting some recognition in this world was to control others. Right? Mm-hmm. And bullying is not just a male issue. We now know that Females, the amount of bullying among females has increased enormously, right? Oh, absolutely. Um, And with children as well. And that's not, again, blaming them. If we bully, there are hidden hurts. Mm -hmm. And would anybody create a holding for those hidden hurts to be revealed and resolved, right? Mm -hmm. And passivity, then, you know, is the bullying of oneself. Mm -hmm. Because you, you push everything down, you repress your own thoughts, your own beliefs, your own needs, right? And passivity, you know, is as much a concern, right, in terms of hidden hurts as bullying is. But they need to be seen as separate issues. Yeah. If, if, yeah. You, if you didn't have anybody that was passive, actually you probably wouldn't have any bullies. Yeah. They are, they are, they are dancing with each other. They are they? dancing yeah. with each other. They are, yeah. And, uh, sorry, no, you go. But it's a bit of a game changer in how we're thinking about bullying or incivility because we've moved into this direction of anti-bullying campaigns and policy galore, yeah. and and this this kind of the policies themselves are are quite controlling in a way. Yeah. You know, I, I was at a keynote at a conference last weekend, mm. and the 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 keynote speaker was talking about his work with Syrian refugees. He yeah. described himself as a third generation displaced person himself, and he mm. talked about that journey. But he put up a, a picture and he's, and one said, all are welcome here. Mm. And the other beside it said, equality or fairness is whatever the words were. Mm. And fairness is not unfair. Yeah, fairness, unfairness is not. And I, mm. I can't yeah. remember how okay. he phrased it. But the, the message was regulative way of thinking about it or present way of thinking about it. All are welcome Right. As opposed to being these regulations, we tell you how to behave because we'll control how you behave, yeah. and that's how we get to. Yeah. Okay. And I, I was just, you know, the same for the bullying work was what I was thinking. So we've gone so much, and this behavior is acceptable. This behavior is not acceptable. Right. Yeah. If you do this, we judge this, and we 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 mobilize policy. 
But you're saying something completely different. Uh, yeah, yeah. And judge not for fear, you may be judged yourself. Yeah. yeah that's a pretty old saying, right? Because, you know, and like I said a few minutes ago, it's, just, it's not about judging behavior as good, bad, or different, right? It's just about understanding behavior. Yeah. How is it that you're shouting at me? What What's leading to that for you, right? How is it that you've been aggressive or violent, right? I'd love to know the source of that. Yeah. Where yeah. you can hear my tone of voice. Whereas if I say, how in the hell did you manage to do that? Now? Yeah. How dare you do that to anybody? Yeah. Sure, no. Sure, I'm mm-hmm. So understanding human behavior is the pathway into the resolution of it. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Any judgment of it increases it. It's yeah, yeah. yeah, and it's it's all very connected in that piece that you talk about about thinking and speaking from the eye yeah. rather than the you. Yeah, and remember when we speak from the eye, that authorship of self, right? We will only do that when we come to that fearless place, or gradually as we get to that fearless place, because it was the most threatening place to be to challenge a parent or a teacher, I need to do that for myself. I need to make my own decisions there, right? We don't do it right. Mm -hmm. And so to come into that I place, again, we need to encounter somebody who supports us to go with that journey inwards, back to the I, and living my life then from the I out, Mm -hmm. not from you in, right? But from I out, yeah. 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 Because what was clear in the book when we were reading it in our conversation that we were having in the car on the way up is that people are exhibiting behaviours based on the experiences that they're having mm. and that that someone else putting a you on this and that's kind of the second tone that you're talking about there yeah. how dare you do this, you yeah. do that, yeah. etc. Um, is not necessarily going to be conducive to that person being able to come to that sense of self or that psychological safety themselves. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And therefore the behavior would probably worsen, as you say. Yeah. Yeah, yeah it's so interesting. There's a great line by, I think it was, who was it? I think it was Carl Jung. What is unconscious in the parent is transmitted to the child. Yeah. Mm. And the child's unconscious response may remain a continual block to a fuller life. Unless at some point the parent finds the safety to come into consciousness Mm -hmm. or the child later on as a young person finds the the psychological safety to come into consciousness. And unconsciousness is such a wise development, right? Because if we had to wake up every morning to the reality, I don't feel loved here, I don't feel seen here, I don't feel I matter here, it would be too. So we put her into our unconscious, right? So unconsciousness is a major creation. And as we then find psychological safety, we then begin to create consciousness. Mm-hmm. But we're the creators. Yeah. 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 yeah that's the important part, isn't it? Yeah. 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 I'm also struck with the way that you talk about these, about these things in, and we said this, in a, there isn't a judgment in how you're talking about the, the, the ways, I think you use... Re- language about, say, the creative ways that mm. we have built walls and yeah. built defences. Yeah. And, and you see it as a, you see it as an almost genius response to it troubling is. times. Is, yeah. And I'm very struck by that because that is so antithetical to the way that I've listened all of my life to the yeah. way that we look at these things, which is that's a coping mechanism for the problem that's caused by X as mm. opposed to, yeah. that's yeah. an ingenious solution to it's survive that. ingenious solution to survive, yeah. It's such yeah. an aff- affirmation of the human spirit um, to do it that yeah. way. And when you see then that our protectors or our defences are ingenious creations in the face of threat, right? And you build your walls. Yeah. And, and some people have massive walls. I had major walls myself. But you can use the stone in those walls then to build bridges. I love that. Mm. You use the same wall, because it's creation, to now build a bridge from the living your life from the inside out. I love that visual. I love it too. Yeah, yeah. It's full of hope. It's full. It is hope. Um, But it's a reality. Yeah, it is. Only we're we're just ingenious, right? We're so powerful as human beings. Yeah. um, Because that that wall and those bricks are the experiences that you've had and the tools that you've developed to cope with these and so on. So they are what you need. They're what created the wall, but they are exactly, as you're saying, what you then need to use and draw from to build the path or build the bridge. Exactly. Yeah, Yeah. I love that. The creativity of, yeah. 
Yeah. yeah. It is creative. That's the piece. It's all this talk about creative almost. Now, we do it in leadership. We've got this the creative leader development. There's always these trends in the way we talk about it. But they're very almost technique. Yeah, yeah. It, it, you know, a non-present way of, of, a not truly present way of engaging with whatever it is that we're, we're trying to do. But this is creativity in a, in a, in a way that is... It's in just, all of us. Yeah, an essence of us. Of some yeah, sort of it's, it's just an essence, exactly. Yeah. Like our, our genius is an essence of us. Yeah, right? yeah. And, you know, labelling children as slow or weak or average. So that's all about the people who put the label on the child. Mm, yeah. So yeah. somehow yeah. the child is where he's at. It's ingeniously created by him, right? I mean, I work with some children, right? They, they won't make any effort, right, to learn, right? But it's so clever because the expectations of them drop. Yeah, they control. They protect them. Yeah. They protect, mm-hmm, yeah. right? If I don't do it, I can't fail it. How mm-hmm. ingenious that is. Yeah. And then I work with other people who, who will so intensely have to get everything perfect, right? But should that's the same as doing nothing. If I get everything perfect, I can't be criticised. Yeah. I've learned my protective mm-hmm. way. My wall. Yeah. yeah. It's the same motivator almost for both behaviours, yeah. Yeah. It's, it's the essence of our nature. Yeah. Is guarding the pearl of great price, which each one of us is. Mm. And we build amazing walls to hide behind, but equally we can build. We will build amazing bridges when we begin to find psychological yeah. safety. Mm-hmm. I love that. Yeah, I really yeah. Do. yeah. A picture yeah. of Molly's beautiful bridge as yeah. you're talking. I just yeah. yeah. Good. One of the one of the pieces also for me. There's a lot. I, I my notes here. You can probably see them in my, mm. in in relation to the, the pieces. But uh, you talk about how as teachers we're, we're drawn to engaging with the students that we think are the brightest, that, that, that we, we spend our time teaching into that space a lot of the time and missing the bigger picture of the, just the, all of those that are in our classroom. And we neglect that inner genius of those who Absolutely. have their other ways of yeah, very surviving. Much. I was Seeing the individual yeah. and the individual ways that each child has found to manage their worlds, yeah. right? But it's interesting, the word teach is an anagram for the word. For another word? Yeah. T-E-S-C-H. What do you think? Have we got it? You're the English teacher. No. <laughs> no, teach. Teach. Remember the anagram? The word was in the word. Cheat. Cheat, right. C-H-E-A-T. T-E-S-C-H. Same word. I have not made that connection. Yeah. <laughs> what does that say about me? My no, I would, I, would have been, I would have been here for another... <laughs> oh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, that's interesting. It is, yeah, yeah. Interesting. Yeah. But isn't it interesting the word mad? It was just such a that yeah. person is mad, right? Mm. But of course, man da. Man wow. da is in the word mad, M A D, M A D A. Wow. <laughs> that's a scary now. <laughs> but it, but it, you know, when you begin to yeah. Yeah. You begin to step back and look. You know, one of the things you say in the book that re- I was like, whoa, that's genius, which is realise to look at with real oh, I love it. eyes. Yeah. Yeah. Realize, yeah. I just, just literally was when I read it. But how clever, yeah. because how true. Yeah, when you realise your eyes are on yourself, when you personalise all your eyes around the other. Yeah. Right? All mm-hmm. eyes on the other person, all eyes. Right? And so... If I'm personalizing all my eyes on how you see me, do you like me? Do you feel I'm smart or clever? Will you stay with me? All my eyes on you. I'm showing mm-hmm. now how enmeshed I am with you. Mm-hmm. When I realize, oh my God, my eyes come back to myself. Yeah. And it's my intimacy with myself and my belief in myself I need to find. I don't want to depend on somebody else to do it. Mm-hmm. And that's then separateness. Yeah. 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 The other thing I I was thinking about it, um, and I I completely believe in this for my own life, where the student is ready, the teacher will come in whatever way the teacher comes. Oh, yeah, 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 I agree. I I really reflected on that when I read it, and I thought, that is true when you're open, when you open the space to allow... The opportunities rise. They come. Mm -hmm. You'll see them then. Yeah. Yeah. Which I thought was... was, um, I thought that was really powerful. Yeah. And yeah, there's a powerful readiness piece about that. And as you said, meeting people where they're, you know, I know you, you mentioned it particularly in your story about um, the individual that came to you that was identifying as Jesus Christ in yeah. that it's about meeting people where they're at. So there's that readiness piece. You can always meet someone 
where they're at. Yeah. And and that realization, right? That yeah. where they're at is exactly where they need to be. Mm-hmm. We're never in the wrong place. We're always where we need to be. Yeah. Otherwise, I'd be criticizing you. How could yeah. you, how could you do that? For yeah. How did you get to that place? Right? Mm-hmm. No, where you are is where you need to be. And I'd love to discover what brought you to that place. Yeah. Well, there's something very calming, reassuring yeah. in the internal angst, you know, that you're in when you think, I've ended up here or I'm trying to find ways to be to, yeah. to, to deal with or to think about or to, to understand what's going on for me. When somebody says, mm-hmm. you are where you're supposed to be, mm-hmm. so you just breathe. Yeah. Absolutely. And open up a space to yeah. think. Yeah. And to, mm-hmm. To and reflect, that's huge. To we, reflect. We don't, yeah. Life is speeding up so much, and I see people writing books now. There's one called The Slow Professor, and there's all these kind of slow down yeah. type of, okay. they're still quite propositional, but they're all about slowing down. But that's a natural way of, of just slowing us into ourselves. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. There's something really important in, yeah. in that. Yeah. Yeah, I think that, that I, fi- I find that, and it, it dovetailed back to me, to your book about work and work, which I read several years ago at a time where where I was really challenged about thinking, is what I do who I am? Mm. Yeah, yeah. If I lose this job, do I lose myself? Mm. Yeah, I mean, yeah. that's where you, that's the logical extension of that. Yeah. The answer is no, but but you, but you there's a seduction that that, um, that we think that. Well, no, it, it's a reality. We've got ourselves seen through being top of the class or being the professor or being the doctor or being the teacher mm. or being the manager. Yeah. If I get, if I see myself through what I do, I found a very creative way to get some attention in the world, but I'm not truly seeing myself because. That's very interesting for leadership. Yeah. Yeah. Scary. Yeah. Scary. yeah. Scary. Interesting scary slash scary. scary. <laughs> yeah. 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 And leadership, what ship are you on? Uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. 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 And I want to become a leader of myself. That, yeah. yeah. I mean, I've heard people talk about self leadership, but I've never seen any. Anything underneath that that makes that that makes me feel comfortable mm. about the way we're using that language, but right now I'm comfortable. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I mean, when you come into possession of yourself, you have a sense of your own individuality, your own person, your own power beyond measure, your own separateness from others, um, an understanding right of how you manage your world up to now and how you now can begin to manage your world in a different way, right? Yeah. Not any more creative than what you've done. But the difference is up to the present, you've unconsciously, creatively found a way of surviving. And then when you find the psychological safety, you now consciously begin to find a way mm. of living. And I love that notion of going from surviving to living. Yeah. Or yes. surviving to thriving, right? Yeah. 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 But you know, if we... If we think in this way and we and we live our lives in this way, mm. there is no bullying then. No. Yeah. No. It's taking care. No passivity. Here. Mm-hmm. It's gone. Yeah. yeah. And I think we we our connection happened through a colleague uh, who is doing work nationally around a bullying awareness week in October. Mm. That that's the piece, and, and we'll be talking more about that in this podcast going forward. But but actually the the. The connection with you has opened up a completely different way of thinking about that, mm, mm-hmm. and I'm very grateful for that because, mm-hmm. because, and I said this before we started the podcast. I'm in about twenty six years of looking at this, <laughs> but it hasn't. When I look back over that twenty six years of work, how much progress have we made? Is questionable in yeah. terms of that, you know. But this, in this piece about being realising, looking with ourselves with real yeah, eyes yeah. and becoming our own, you know, coming into ourselves, yeah. being present of our, with authors ourselves. Authors of ourselves. Authors of ourselves. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Would mean you wouldn't be needing to engage in controlling anyone else or, or in that behaviour that doesn't suit what I want because I've let go of all of that. Yeah. yeah. And, yeah. I've, and I've been, there's a piece in your work, I don't know if this is right, but I'll just throw it out that I'm seeing a curiosity about the other person. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And I love that. Yeah. Because yeah. then when you're curious about another person, you're not in a judging or disliking, yeah. you're yeah. in a an open an openness yeah. Yeah. space. Yeah. It's like I'd love to hear your story. Mm-hmm. That curiosity, yeah. right? Or the curiosity, how, how is it that you're saying that? Or what makes you say that? Or yeah. how is it that you want 
into that profession. I'd love to know your story. Yeah. Curiosity. Mm -hmm. Now, I know curiosity killed the cat. <clears throat> yeah. I remember that. Yeah. I don't even know, don't know that um, in Japanese gardens in Kildare, is it? Oh, yes. Oh, yeah. 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 And, and then they have, um, what do you call it? With horses or what is it? What's the... But they have, it's a nice garden that you walk around, you know. But I I walked into the Japanese garden and got walked around it. And then I went, walked to his reception, out to the other garden. And around that garden, there are a lot of sculpture pieces, right, which I really liked. So when I came back into the reception area, I went up to the reception, and a, couple, a young couple in reception, a uh, young man, a young woman, and I said to the young woman, I said, I, I, had, I'm ju I just have a curiosity. And she said to me, you know now, she said, curiosity killed the cat. <laughs> and I said, I do, but I said the cat has nine lives. Yeah, nice. <laughs> oh, I love that. I love that. And the young man said, how did you come well, up with that answer? Yeah. <laughs> so quick, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yeah, okay. it's a lovely thing when you meet anybody to show curiosity. Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. And I, I'm, I, I'm convinced you don't bully or injure somebody if you know them. No. If you really know them. I'm not sure. It's no. that possible. Yeah. But remember now, if I injure or bully somebody, there's something going on in me. Crying out of me. Mm -hmm. That needs to be seen. Yeah. It's not about the other person, it's about myself. Yeah. Because you quoted Wilkin in your book, and I think the quote was something like, the terrible... Oh, yes. Is cr is, is, Everything terrible is something is crying out for out. love. Yeah. 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 That was really, yeah. you know, yeah. I... Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense yeah. to me. It's a lovely, it's great line. Everything yeah. terrible is something crying out for yeah. love. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. tell us about your book that you're finishing. You mentioned you Oh yeah, the your, book yeah. of realizations. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, <it does. laughs> um, to read. so it's written now. Um, and basically it, it's all the realizations I've had around human behaviour, human mm. suffering over all the years now. So yeah. it's just bringing it all together. Yeah. yeah. Be good. When will it be? Will it, is it published? No, I was just talking to publishers at the moment. Okay. Now, so my guess it should be out later this year or early yeah. next year. Brilliant. Yeah. 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 Something for us to look forward to. <laughs> you might even talk to us again about it. Yeah, great. <laughs> kind good. Of. Good. Okay. Fabulous. Look, I think we're kind of coming up I in think, time anyway. Yeah, yeah. I think we are. We usually. Um, we, we At the end of a podcast, we usually do three questions. You know, but yeah. I, I don't. I would prefer not to. Okay. Yeah. If you know, but I, I guess what I'd like to, to ask instead is, and I think we've talked about it. If 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 because we we'll, we we'll talk about this in terms of the the time around the anti bullying sure. uh, week, if there is a message you'd like to put out about the challenges that we face around bullying, I think we've mentioned it already. But what would you say? I think I think the most important message I want to put out about bullying. Is that it's a solution, it's not a problem. Okay. And to then inquire, what, what has the bullying been a solution for? Mm -hmm. The source of the... And the source of the bullying, right. And, and we, we, I think we mentioned that, that the, the tendency at the moment is to have anti-bullying campaigns, right? That, for me, that will increase it. What I would love is have a campaign for understanding bullying, because... It is a solution, and equally understanding passivity, because passivity is a solution to adverse experiences that we've had in childhood, right? So, but if we now begin to have a campaign of understanding the nature, what are bullying, what are passivity, I work with a lot of people, young people who do a lot of self harming yeah. and cutting mm -hmm. themselves. But sure, if I say to the person, how can you do that to yourself? Yeah. Whereas if I say, I have no doubt, right, that those cuts and those scars are representing cuts that you've experienced in your life, and I'd love to hear about those cuts. Mm -hmm. Now I'm attempting to understand the cuts. Yeah. And now the story slowly emerges. Mm -hmm. And there's always a story. Yeah. Yeah. It's like coming from a different point of origin, isn't it? Yeah. 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 It's really yeah. powerful. It's, it's amazing. Right. 
Well, Lise, I know I've said before, I'm thinking about wanting to, you know, don't meet your heroes, but I have to say I am thrilled <laughs> that I've had this time with you. I, I, I'm, it has surpassed what I could have hoped for. Um, it's, I have experienced in times where I've, I've met people who have written messages, but they're incongruent with who they are when you meet them. Yeah. And you are not that. Okay, I'm mm-hmm. going to say that too. It's very congruent. And... I just feel even being in your presence brings a person back to themselves a bit. Yeah. And I'm very yeah. grateful yeah. for that time with you. So yeah. Yeah. I just People want to say, say thank that. you. Yeah. They do. It's the hero's journey, isn't it? But we're always on the hero's journey. Yeah. Either by building walls or building bridges. Yeah. yeah. I know what I want yeah. to do. Yeah. And there's a bit of like encouragement of, I've no doubt, well, I'm feeling this way. And I've no doubt that some of our listeners will be feeling this way of, thinking about where exactly am I now on that journey, right. you know, and just revisiting that Absolutely. a little bit. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah. it's been amazing. It's been Ref- fabulous yeah. talking to you. Yeah. Reflection. Yeah. Reflection. Yeah. Reflection. Yeah. yeah. Mm. Mm. Good. Thank you so much. Thank you. Me. Thank yeah. you both. It's been right. such a pleasure. To talk to you again. <laughs> talk to you again. <laughs> and the word again, play with it. You know, when they say, oh, I want to get this one. Yeah. Let's, see, now, let's see whether you get this one oh, no. so you know um, I'll, I'll see you again now right what's, what's the the word within the word there now e- no really bad each time I see you there's a game there's a game Oh, hey, 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 hey. Oh, I'm feeling as the English teacher a bit like that. So great there. Oh my god. There's a game. There's a game. Yeah. Oh, there's definitely a game here. It was a game. <laughs> Good. Thank, Thank you. Thank you. Brilliant. So Thank you.